Hello, my name is Sydney Pertnoy and I am chair of the board of the Holocaust Memorial on Miami Beach. It gives me great pleasure to be able to say a few words on behalf of the organization who sponsored Names Not Numbers in your school. We are currently living through extraordinary times and have had to adjust to our new reality. Under these conditions, working from your homes, you were able to complete this project and for that we are grateful to all of the students for your dedication. Thank you to the teachers and schools for ensuring that your students could benefit from the Names Not Numbers program. This year, schools from Miami, Broward County, Palm Beach County, and Orlando all participated, creating documentaries that will be a part of the historical record. You should all be very proud. Most importantly, I want to thank our Holocaust survivors who participated. They are true heroes, and we are forever indebted to these brave individuals who volunteer their time and give of their heart. To all the students who participated in this project, I sincerely hope that you take with you memories that will last a lifetime. Thank you to Sharon Horowitz, Executive Director of the Holocaust Memorial Miami Beach, and Daniel Reed, Education Coordinator, for sponsoring the Names Not Numbers program for the second year. Recognize the importance of this program, the Florida Department of Education generously funded our efforts. Our deepest appreciation to Tova Rosenberg, the director and founder of Names Not Numbers, for creating this program and to the filmmakers and editors who helped create these films. As time marches on and our precious survivors continue to age, it is up to the next generation to stand up against all forms of racism and bigotry. The films you helped create are a testament to the importance of teaching about the Holocaust and triumphing over hatred. Thank you very much. Tell me a fact and I'll learn. Tell me a truth and I'll believe. But tell me a story and it will live in my heart forever. The Names Not Numbers Oral History Film Documentary Project is remembering the stories of the Holocaust and is telling the story of the Holocaust for the world to hear, for the world to learn, and to inspire future generations to combat anti-Semitism and all forms of hatred and intolerance. This unique project is in its 16th year. Over 2,500 survivors and 6,000 students have participated in it worldwide. The students were instructed by teachers and professionals. They learned interviewing techniques from journalists. They learned filming techniques and editing skills from documentary filmmakers. The students interviewed, filmed, and edited the two-hour interviews with each survivor to make 20-minute oral histories that are compiled in the Names Not Numbers documentary at the school. You're about to view the documentary Names Not Numbers, a movie in the making. This film chronicles the students as they are being trained by the professionals and includes their reflections. In it is embedded approximately 10 minutes from each interview. This is the student's work. Their filmed and edited interviews. Through this project, our students are preserving history and they are the witnesses to the witnesses. They announced on the radio that there's 300 German planes are coming to bomb Babrusk. Everybody go to the shelters. Started to fall like hail on the city. And then suddenly we see that buildings are starting to fall around us. When they come out, Babrusk was on fire. 
everything was burning. How can one describe a place of horror, hell on earth? We didn't talk about our experiences until the late 70s. And I have a duty, I feel. God spared me so that I can tell my story. Good afternoon, students. You know how important this is. This is something where we were able to um, have this team come out here and then use 21 students to develop your opportunity to actually meet with survivors and interview them. You are embarking on a process that um, is going to help alleviate, I think, what is the greatest worry of Holocaust survivors today. Their greatest worry is that no one will be there when they are gone to tell their story. I chose to do Names Not Numbers because I thought it was really an incredible once in a lifetime opportunity. A lot of people don't get a chance to meet a Holocaust survivor or hear them speak even if it's in a large setting. So the chance to be able to get to talk to one on such a personal like intimate level, it was an opportunity I had to seize. Personally, I didn't know much about the Holocaust. I was never really taught too much about it and I felt almost in a sense guilty that like we weren't being taught it and I didn't know. So I really wanted to get this like firsthand experience of hearing somebody's story and just actually getting to the subject of the Holocaust and not letting it be forgotten and not sharing that with other people that are in my same situation that don't know about the Holocaust really. I'm Jewish myself and recently I was in the cast of the Holocaust play we did, I Never Saw Another Butterfly. And when my director had posted about the opportunity to do this, I felt that it was going to be an interesting and really important experience to have, considering that many of the survivors are continuing to pass. You're going to be, I would say, witnesses to the witnesses. I'm excited the most about meeting and getting to know personally each Holocaust survivor because I think it is so important to further their story and make sure that the generations after us and the generations of my classmates and myself's kids get to hear and truly understand the story of what happened. As long as there are people who remember it, then there's less of a chance of it happening again because history always repeats itself because people make the same mistakes. They forget what happened before and they just keep doing the same thing over and over. So I, I think as long as we remember what happened, we'd be able to steer away from, ever, from something like this ever occurring again. I think it's important to interview and film a survivor because as years go by, there are gonna be fewer and fewer survivors left. There's not gonna be that opportunity to hear firsthand about the experiences that someone went through and it's important to know because you never want that to happen again. I think it's important for non-Jewish people to learn about what happened because we feel for them too. It was a really hard experience for everyone and we all have families or friends and members and stuff that were Jewish and their families had to go through that pain too. So we want to make sure that we're there for them and know we love them. The reason why these stories need to be told is because as generations progress, people start to forget. And you're going to put it together where it can be passed from generation to generation as well. A representative from Names Not Numbers came in to speak to us. And he explained what to do during the interviews, how to talk to people, how to make sure that you're getting your full answer out, how they're going to respond fully to your answer, and it was really helpful. Hi. How's everybody doing? Good. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. I'm here to talk to you today about the interview process. One thing he said, like, facts and then feelings, because yes, there was a lot of facts, but the whole point of talking to a survivor is to see how their experience affected them and how they felt about it. The goal of the interview is to get their story from before the war, their experiences during the war, 
and the experiences after the war. And those are three very different stories, okay? Why do we care about the story before the war? We've cared about the story before the war because you understand the loss more, and deep, more deeply, if you understand what they had. You first want to get a timeline of the facts. So you're going to read a biography of, of someone and you're going to start thinking of questions. You know their story. So it's very easy to slip into the, uh, you know, to slip into the mistake of, I don't have to ask that question because I know it already. You might know it, but the film doesn't know. One other tip that I can, an important tip that I can give you is, don't rush the questions. You're going to be sitting there with a list of questions. Survivors are going to be sitting across from you. And you ask a question. And then they answer the question, maybe with one or two words, maybe with one or two sentences, and then they stop. Your natural inclination is to go ahead to the next question. Don't. Give it a, give it a few seconds. Um, and if you have to have a follow-up to that question that they didn't answer, ask it again or ask it again in a different way. So go slow, don't rush the questions. Personally, I just get very emotional hearing these stories because it's, it's, really, it's like a tragedy, what these people went through. And I was just afraid of when I get into the interview process, if I become too emotional, like how will that make them feel? And he really just explained that no one is gonna judge you if you are too emotional. And honestly, the survivors, they support you. And he shared a story about how one of them hugged a kid who was crying. And that just is like incredible because they know that it's tough for others to hear because it was insanely tough for them. So I just learned to not be afraid if I have to cry or if I feel too emotional, that it's really just a part of the process. My favorite class was definitely learning how to use the camera, um, how to use the slate, and announce each clip so that it was easier when going back into editing. And I, I personally loved that class because I would like to go into film. I'd love to be a director, scriptwriter, editor. Just having that short experience to learn the different techniques and filming and the, the rule of thirds, things I didn't know before, makes me feel that much more prepared to do what I'm about to do. The rule of thirds has four points of focus. As you can see there, it's like one, two, three, and four. Whatever you want your viewer's attention to go to, it has to be placed near, not exactly like in that, in that point, but like near that point of focus. So in this example that I have here, you can see that the survivor, like her eyes are very close to um, the number one point of focus, right? It's usually more appealing to the eye to see a subject set aside. It's not like a, a rule that you can break. Like I've seen other um, interviews where the, the subject is set in the middle, which is fine. But for this documentary, we usually do it this way. All the room that you see on her side, we also use it when we're editing. We use it to put the lower thirds. During the interview, uh, we try to use the, the close up or the extremely close up when people are having like an emotion or they want to just take a moment before they start telling a really hard story for them. Usually those moments we want to go like to their face and like really show um, how they're feeling. Um, just because we want the audience to feel what they're, what they're going through like telling these stories. Today I was able to learn a lot, not only about the process of using a professional camera and using mics and going over sound, but also just how to treat the survivors respectfully during the process and how to get the real story from them while also not invading their space and making them feel comfortable like they're in an environment where they feel they can share and be open with us. And I'm very excited for the rest of this experience. To prepare for the interview, we read about her information beforehand and then created questions based off of that and then also general questions that we wanted to know. I feel very honored that he wants to come to us and tell us his story because he's been through so much in his life. He went to the camps at such a young age and he lost almost everyone he loved, so it's going to be very hard for him to talk about this. I'm just, I just feel so honored that he wants to tell us his story and be a part of this film. I'm a little bit nervous just about how much emotion is going to be revealed from both the survivor and the interviewers. 
I'm feeling kind of nervous because I've never worked with the equipment before and I've never given an interview, so I'm like kind of nervous to see how it all plays out. These people are real people. They aren't just numbers, they have names, they have stories, and it's very important to get that across, that they're not just some statistic, they're not just some number, like, they're an actual person with an actual story. Names, not numbers. My name is Norman Frodgman. I was born on September 11th of 1929 and the place of birth was Warsaw, capital of Poland. My immediate family, there were four of us. My mom, my dad, I had a sister who was 18 months younger than I, and myself. My dad was self-employed. My family was in the transportation business in the city of Warsaw. And that means they had horse and wagons and trucks. The holidays were very festive. We were fortunate enough to live in the same building where my grandparents who owned this entire building. I know this is like 40 tenants in there. So uh, they lived just a floor above us, if I remember. So anything, <laughs> I ran to grandma for help. Came a time of Passover. My grandmother would load up one of the uh, wagons with matzo, with wine, with, with fish for the kids and distribute it to all her children living in the city of Warsaw. I only have four years of schooling. That's all I managed to squeeze in prior to the beginning of the war. Judith Goldstein. I was born in Vilna, Poland. But uh, now it's, the city is part of, the uh, capital of Lithuania. I would say I was born probably in the late 30s. It's hard for me to say because my mother made me older on the papers. I have one sibling and he's a boy older than I am. My father was a mechanical engineer, and, but he also played the violin and my mother was a clothes designer. They were just very nice people and they knew exactly how to handle children. My childhood is very short and I lost it. My childhood years I lost very quickly. So I can't really describe it too well. All I know is that I loved music and uh, because my father loved music. So that's all I can remember. My name is Mary Eckstein. I was born on May 14th, 1936. I was born in Budapest, Hungary, in the Jewish neighborhood where most, most of the Jews live. I didn't know anybody at that time who was not Jewish, except for the janitor of my building, but uh, they were the only ones. And all my friends and acquaintances were Jewish. My father was a salesman, sales rep in a textile wholesale company. My mother was a dressmaker. I didn't have any, any siblings, but I had a first cousin, and we grew up like sisters. We fought like sisters, and we constantly were together. We were uh, fairly religious. I grew up in an Orthodox home. I, I went to a Jewish school. I was never able to finish second grade, because Jews were not allowed to go to school in the middle of my second grade. We were uh, kosher and uh, shomer Shab Shabbos, which means uh, observant of the Shabbos. We had, uh, we had a normal Shabbat. My father went to shul, went to temple, and when he came back, that's when we had our dinner. My name is Anya. Bogusheva Baum. I was born in Russia, Belarus, Slutsk, 1930, February the 13th. I had a mother, a father, and a brother. My mother was a housewife, and my father was working in uh, a sanitation. 
My mother was um, a very strict mother. My father was a wonderful man. My town were about 18,000 Jews. My relationship with non-Jewish children was just okay. But I still didn't know I was Jewish in a way, mm -hmm. you know. I didn't know what it means Jewish, that's what it is. I didn't know even the word yet. I didn't learn the word anti-Semitism until maybe after the war. I learned that the non-Jewish kids, the Polish kids, did not like the Jewish kids. I can't say that I blamed them for it. They were taught. If they were angry at the Jewish kid, they would call him Zhidówka Parchówka, meaning you Jewish fungus. There was a, a law that the Jews were not able to shop in Christian stores. And that was very early on. And uh, it was a hot day and uh, I wanted an ice cream cone. And uh, we stopped in an ice cream uh, store, ice cream parlor, and I went in and my, with my mother and they refused to give, serve us and because we were Jews. And when we left the store, I was on the street crying. I had to be very young. And uh, a woman stopped and wanted to know what's wrong. And I told her I can't have ice cream. And she went in and she got me an ice cream cone. That was the first experience. I don't know exactly when it happened, but this was the first time. Now you have to understand this. The Hungarian government did not allow deportations early on, but they did have restrictions on Jews. From the mid-1930s, Jewish students were not able to go to university because they were not admitted. And that was at the very beginning. All the jewelry was confiscated from the Jews at one point, and I'm not sure exactly when, but it was early on. Uh, the Jews were not supposed to have electric appliances. Of course, in those days, you only had an iron or, or a toaster. There was no other electric appliance, but you were not supposed to have it. So it started early on. The Germans invited Vilna in 1941. Uh, in June. My father, which was on a weekend, I guess, I can't remember if it was Saturday or Sunday, wanted to take my brother and myself on a boat ride. We never got even to the water. The bomb started to fall like hail on the city, and we barely, barely made it home. My mother was not with us, but she was happy to see us back. And that was the beginning of hell. I remember it was on a Friday morning with my grandmother to the market. And suddenly we see airplanes in the skies and anti-aircraft guns shooting at it. We were completely unprepared for it. We were in Warsaw for seven days at the beginning, to the, at the beginning of the war. And the city was under constant bombardment. So upon the urging of the Polish government, they advised us to evacuate the city, which being in a transportation business, we had to take a horse and wagon. We couldn't use a car because there was no gasoline. The military confiscated that. So we took out and became instant refugees. And they advised us to go eastward towards the Russian border. So we traveled strictly at night. We heard that uh, the German attacking Slutsk, they're not far away. My mother's sister said, we have to run away because the German, you don't know what the German could do to you. The German were bombing Slutsk and my father got wounded, uh, wounded from um, a shrapnel from the bomb. And the, my mother bandaged him up and he said, I cannot go because I have to go to the army. If they're not gonna, if I'm not gonna go to the army, 
they're gonna catch me, the Russian ones, and they're gonna kill me anyway. He said, because I'm deserter. So he said, you go with the sisters, listen to them, run. I saw my father for that one day, and I never saw him again. Because anything that moved in the daytime was shot at by the German Air Force. So in the daytime we would, hid, we would hide in forests and walk over to peasants for a loaf of bread and a glass of milk. And eventually we wound up very close to the Soviet Union. We stayed in that very small town. Our parents enrolled us into a school there temporarily. People passing through that small town brought regards from the city of Warsaw, saying to us, <clears throat> yes, there is an occupation, but the Germans don't bother anybody. So my dad, in all his wisdom, decided why should we stay on there as refugees? Let's go back home. Because according to the propaganda of our country, the war should last maybe a month and Poland comes out victorious. How false it was. The Germans, they came in very organized, very powerful. And within two weeks, there was no more Poland. My grandfather was a very known person in Slutsk. He was like a mayor and he was a what, banker. And he died before the war, but he was very rich. My brother caught his coat that he gave us with a very beautiful coat. That's all we had it by running. Just the coat, clothes on, on the body, and that's that. We stayed in Babruisk overnight because they, they announced on the radio that there was 300 German planes are coming to bomb Babruisk. Everybody go to the shelters. So everybody started to run to the shelters, and uh, then they made an announcement to come out. When they come out, Babruisk was on fire. Everything was burning, but for us was ready cattle trains. The, for the, uh, it's not for, just for us, it was about 300 people. And where all of them, they said, go to the cattle train immediately because they could attack us again. So we all went to the cattle trains. Four days we were traveling, no food, no, no water, nothing, four days. Then they told us to come out from the train fast because they're gonna bomb the train. So anyway, everybody from the cattle train ran to the ditches Everybody ran to the ditches, who were hiding in the ditches, and bombs, the plane came and bombed the last one, and a lot of people got killed. The western part was given to Germany, the eastern part to the Soviet Union, and we found ourselves on the part of the Soviets. And one thing to go back, we had to smuggle a border. My dad hired a guide, and I recall that <clears throat> we were stopped at the border by the Russian border guards, put him into a makeshift jail for a few days. Then they took my father out. They separated him from us. As of that night, I was not to see my father physically in 22 years. After the war, I found out that he's alive. He survived in Siberia as a prisoner. I remember uh, the grown-ups around me were talking about that the Germans are here. Well, we did not uh, directly dealt with the Germans. The Hungarian Nazi party, the Aerocross party, was the ones who carried out the Germans' instructions. The Aerocross party, the men, they were men mostly, uh, were either teenagers or older men, too old to go to the front. Now, the teenagers were very gun happy. If you look at them uh, crossly, they would shoot you. Uh, the old men were not easier either. Uh, so the arrow crossmen was, was worse than the name Germans. Adolf Eichmann came to Hungary to, uh, to solve the Jewish problem. 
My father wasn't there. We had to have a blackout and, and the windows had to be covered. And, uh, and then we had, there were bombings. And so we had to go almost every night to the air raid shelter. And we always had a, a suitcase at the door ready to just pick up and go to the air raid shelter. First we were in the Jew house. Uh, that uh, immediately after the Yellow Star decree was carried out, they de designated certain buildings as Jew houses. And, Jew and Jews were allowed to live only in a Jew house. It wasn't easy because uh, we were not allowed to leave. We could only leave at a certain time. Raoul Wallenberg was a Swedish diplomat. He saved thousands of Hungarian Jews. Wallenberg and Karl Lutz, who was the Swiss ambassador, managed to make a deal with, other, with Eichmann who saw that they would issue so-called safe passes. They were called Schutz passes. Whoever had a Schutz pass was considered a subject of either the Swiss or the Swedish government, and they were under the protection of the Swiss or the Swedish government. They rented apartments all over the city, and those who had the Schutz passes were moving into those apartments, and supposedly they were safe houses. And the Hungarians, the Arrow Cross, all the Germans had no jurisdiction over them. My mother was able to get a Schutz Pass. One day in October, we went out to look for a place. My aunt came with us and she was able to get on the streetcar and the bus. My mother and I were captured and attached to a march leaving the city. It was cold and uh, pouring rain, and we walked all afternoon. And then we got to the brick factory. Three months after they occupied Vilna city, they formed the newly formed ghetto. And my parents and my brother and I were forced into the ghetto. Well, in the ghetto, we lived in one apartment. One room had in every corner a family. There was very little food. There was very little medicine. Um, it was very sad. Vilna had 80,000 Jews. And when they were in the ghetto, slowly, 70,000 were already murdered at a nearby forest called Ponari. People who were professional, like my father, they used to employ them to go out of the ghetto. But when, if, God forbid, you walked into the ghetto and you had a little food on yourself, you were punished heavily and gotten 25 on your back, and, so, and some didn't survive. My father did that. One woman brought in a bag of beans, and she was murdered for it. She was shot. How can one describe a place of horror in describing it, what it was? Hell on earth, room for 125,000 people. But by cleansing the small towns around Warsaw, and it was an influx of German refugees, suddenly the population swelled to close to a half a million. And a tremendous it, it created tremendous problems. People dying from starvation, disease of typhus, old age, and that was all around you. This was the beginning of our lives. That was the beginning of the ghetto. So tragedy started to set in right at the beginning, and that was in the fall of 1940. They asked us to give away fur coats, which meant a lot because Poland is cold. Then all the jewelry that you possessed. I was in the Warsaw Ghetto for its inception, which was in the fall of 1940. 
to almost the very end. I was taken out of the ghetto May, I, either the first or third of 1943. And that was during the heroic Jewish uprising. I worked, you know, there was a place called the Umschlagplatz. Umschlag, and it translated means to exchange. Now, what was the purpose of it? They brought provisions from the Aryan side because the ghetto was divided. Aryan side, Jewish side. From the Aryan side, they used to buy rotten potatoes and carrots and all. Bring them to the Umschlagplatz, to the exchange place loaded on Jewish platforms brought into the ghetto. And later on, that Umschlagplatz became, being it had a railroad siding, it became the place of deportation with all the Jews going into their demise were going from there. Later, I was already transported to one of the extermination camps. Can you tell us about the liquidation of the ghetto? Yes, I can. They separated men from women and boys from children also. From, and that was the last time I saw my father. And then the women and some children were standing in rows and this Nazi comes over to me. And he says in German, but I'll say it in English, you little one, you have to go with the children. And that moment, he looked away to the side. And then when he looked back, at the meantime, my mother pushed me forward so he didn't see me. But he saw the row behind me. And I'll never forget that moment. My little friend, Itala, she was seven years old. She took off her knapsack and cried, Mommy, Mommy, don't ever forget me. Here is my knapsack. They're taking me to Ponare and they're going to shoot me. She already knew about Ponare. And that's exactly what happened to her. They took us in a train for one week. No food, no toilets, no water, nothing. All I know that they loaded us into those uh, freight cars that has room maybe with, for 40 people. There were 120 of us packed in there. And prior to our boarding, they put chlorine powder in there because they were afraid of spread of disease and that chlorine powder uh, was supposed to prevent disease from happening. Now, what's interesting for the journey, they gave you two buckets, five gallons of water and one empty bucket to relieve yourself for 120 people. Finally, the door opened and we walked out. We arrived there and uh, the uh, railroad does not go in directly to the camp. The railroad, you get off a certain station and you have to walk, I think, maybe like three kilometers into the camp. And then you come into an embankment, you see barbed wire, mines, signs that they're going to be shot if you trespass, watchtowers and patrols, Germans with, with uh, dogs. And then, of course, the next day, all hell broke loose. There's a German standing at the head of a column and simply motions, left or right, life or death. And this is when I, of course, was uh, separated from my mom and, and sister and all ladies went one way, in my case, never to be seen again. And another thing, right there, they took us to showers. Cold water, of course. Then you're going in, into the barracks. When we arrived to Kaiserwald, we lived in a barrack, 
and they uh, fed us, they called it soup. There was more water than soup. There was nothing in that soup, but and a, one slice of bread. And my mother, many times, would take that one slice of bread and break a piece in addition to me and give it to me. No matter what they gave you, you were still hungry. So yes, people lost a lot of weight. One day, my mother came into the barrack and she said, I want to take her out for the day. That day when we came back, there was no children left. She must have known something. She insisted to take me out. And we were there for a while. Then they took us to Stutthof. One day they came an announcement. All children under 13 years of age out of the barrack. My mother held on to me. She did not let me go. Then another announcement came. If we come in and find any children under 13 years of age, we will come in and shoot everybody in the barrack. She still tried to hold on to me, but I left and I walked out from the barrack. What did I see? A truck full of children departing. And only a few children were standing there, including me. Then when the truck departed, they told me, now I, you can go back to the barrack. I'll never forget that moment either. It's cemented in my brain. After Stutthof, we were taken to another camp called Torun, T-O-R-U-N. It was a working camp. When we were standing on roll call, a Nazi comes over to me and gives me a blow in my head. Because on roll call, you, you have to stand like a statue. I was a little kid, so what do I know? I looked here, I looked there. Suddenly, I received a blow in my head. I saw my, my head on the ground and up and down and up and down. Finally, I realized I do have my head. After a week, we were still in the brick factory, and we were sort of safe. So after a week, they separated the children from the mothers. There were not too many men there that I can recall. And they marched us back to Budapest. And then about four days later, my mother came. My mother was taken from the brick factory to the Aerocross headquarters. They were taking the women down to the basement, lined them up, and they were shooting one by one. And just then, a German officer came in. He stopped the killings and ordered the Aerocross men to let the women go. And so my mother was saved. After a few days, my mother found us a place in a safe house. It was a three-bedroom apartment, about 60 or 80 people living there. At night, you couldn't walk around because uh, people were sleeping on the, on the floor. Our janitor's wife, her name was Kathy. Every week, I don't know how many times she did that, she came with a basket of food. Now, I don't know why she did it. My mother couldn't pay her. She had no money. And she was a Nazi. And we were Jews, so it doesn't make sense. And I'm convinced if she didn't come with the food, we would have starved. And then they came December 5th, I remember. The Aerocurs came, and they took the young woman. They didn't take my mother, because we had a shtick. She would lay down that she was sick. And I, the, the Aerocross man came to the room. I was just about handing her a glass of water. I was eight years old. And so they didn't take my mother. And then a couple of weeks later, in December, they took my, they took my aunt, and she ended up in Bergen-Belsen. And again, they didn't take us, because my mother and I reenacted our little game. And for some reason, they, they didn't take us. Then we came to, uh, near Stalingrad, a little village, it's of course Amo, they call it. When we came out from the train, the peasant people greeted us, 
and they said, uh, uh, where are your horns? So my mother said, what do you mean horns? They said, Jewish people have horns. So my mother said, and my mother's system, we people like you are, we have no horns, just a different religion. Then I started asking my mother questions. And she said, you're Jewish, and you know, this is a nationality. I didn't know what, it, I heard the name Jewish, but I didn't know it's a nationality. I thought everybody is equal. So then, you know, we, we start having a little food, a little, they give us a cafe, in cafeteria, we had to go to a restaurant to have a little, a little bit of water with a little rice on top and a small piece of bread. A piece of bread for a whole week with my mother and my brother and me. So my brother, my mother gives a piece of bread to him with a little water soup. And my brother said, I'm so hungry, Ma, I want to eat. So, uh, so she said, I cannot give you no more the bread because we're not going to have it for the whole week. So he started to cry. So my mother said, you know, children, eat the whole piece of bread. The eat God going to give us for next day. We had a little, tiny, little room, very tiny, with an oven. And a cut, one cut bed, like the soldiers have. My brother was sleeping on the floor. Me and my mother sleep on the cut back and, and uh, covered with that coat. That coat was full of lies. My head was full of lies. My mother was washing my head with kerosene just to kill the lies. When I shake my head, the lies were all over crawling. I got sick with typhus. 14 days typhus. If 14 days the fever doesn't drop, you die. My uncle was in, working in Kreml with Stalin. He was a very big shot. He was a financier from all over the, for, uh, for all Russia. My mother wrote a letter that my uh, Anya is very sick. She has no clothes. We have nothing to shave her head. We got a parcel from him. My mother took that parcel. She took that piece of, took the parcel. It was a piece of material for a little dress. It was little tiny little shoes for me in a hat. And she showed that through the window because she's not allowed to go to the hospital in because it's contagious. She showed me all through the window. And I wanted so much to leave, to, to wear that dress and the little shoes in the head. And I was looking, I was like praying, you know. And, uh, and she said, that's for you. She showed me through the window, that's for you, dress and the shoes. So she came on the 14th day, and the doctor said, I never heard things like that, he said. You can take her home. She's okay. So I survived. My mother was working in the wartime. She was working in a hospital as a nurse for those wounded soldiers. When a soldier died, you know, so she took off the boots and the coat, and she brought it to me because I had no shoes. When a soldier died, she used to also bring the bread that they were giving for him to eat with a piece of lard. And she was bringing all the time for us to eat that. When they, uh, they, they start uh, pushing away the, the, the Germans from Stalingrad, and my mother, my mother's sisters didn't want to stay there, so they went to Asia. So me, my mother said, what, and my brother, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. We're not running anymore. That's enough to run. We cannot take it anymore. They start pushing away the all allies from England, from America, from everywhere, started pushing away the Germans from Stalingrad. If they would take Stalingrad, they would take almost the whole world, you know. The Germans were beginning to have setbacks, and they inducted every able-bodied German into the armed services, creating a shortage of labor, and they were forced to delve into concentration camps. So I, with 3,000 others, was sold by the Germans to a German ammunition factory called Hasag. I went from there to a camp called Skarzesko. And that was another hell on earth. 
we were trans uh, evacuated from the camp in Poland. We were sent to Buchenwald, and that's when I got my jacket. They had a very good system, and they're geniuses about it. To identify these things, everybody, now I, yellow is a Jew. Red, for some reason or other, I'm declared a political Jew. I never had anything to do with politics. Now, green were criminals. Pink were homosexuals. Black, I believe, were gypsies. And they had all different, all the German had to do is look at you, uh, triangle that you have, and he more or less knew what, make, what, who you are. From there, when they evacuated Poland to Buchenwald, we spent like maybe three weeks in quarantine in Buchenwald. From there, they sent us to a branch called Schlieben. And there we were busy manufacturing uh, uh, bazookas for the German uh, Home Guard. And from there, from there we went on to the Death March. The Russians were bombing, and we heard already the bombing from far away. The soldiers decided they're going to take us on a death march. So a lot of people froze to death. Anybody who was not walking together with the other people, they would shoot them. So she grabbed me, and I walked with her. She helped me walk. And this is how my mother saved me one more time. And then suddenly, everybody realized that all the soldiers who heard from far away the explosions, they started to run away too. And suddenly we realized that we are alone. And that was really very difficult also. What do we do now? So we were left behind. And then the women didn't know what to do. So, and we were already forward in another city, not in Torun, but in a, another Polish town called Bydgoszcz. And then my mother and other women, a group, small group, and other women ran into other uh, doors and they knocked on the doors and they told them, and I, that I remember, that there is a basement somewhere, we should go and hide there. So maybe we were about 10 people or so, and we heard still Nazis coming and banging on the doors and waiting for people, Juden, Jews, to come out. But nobody was coming out. So they, sh they started to shoot at the door. There was a, a, a place where there was an, a, a chimney. So she said, let's crawl into the chimney little place. And that's what we did. So we were saved again from the bullets. And that was actually the last time the Germans were looking for us. First of all, we saw it by the Air Force. I remember when they went to uh, bomb the city of Dresden, we could not see the sun. That's how many airplanes. They pulverized the city. And, you know, they were throwing down thin foil to prevent it from radar to picking it up. And some of those little strips fell into our camp. This was our connection with the Allies already, you know. After uh, the, uh, they pushed away the German from Stalingrad, we went on a truck, a, a kind of military truck, and they brought us to Slutsk. And we came to Slutsk, the Slutsk was still on fire because there were jobs, but the war wasn't over yet. And then my mother, we didn't have where to go, but my mother found a soldier that knew my father very well. He said, you're alive. He said, oh, she said, I need a place where to stay. So he arranged for us a little room where to stay. 
we, I found out my mother wanted to present people that they knew us, that they loved us. And we found out what happened to my father. My father in Slutsk in 1942, they took 8,000 Jews. They told them to dig their own grave. They tell them to get undressed and they kill them one by one. And this is how we saw it. We knew, of course, that uh, we didn't know how many places were liberated, but we knew some guards started to talk to us, telling us that, uh, that the, war, the, the war is coming to an end. We went to sleep, and in the morning, we look, there were no more guards. And there was a tank standing right in front of the place. We were on a march already, on a death march. And we were afraid, oh, this is probably where they're going to kill us, to cover up their atrocities. But the turret opens up and out comes a Russian officer. And that was the day of my liberation, which was May 8th of 1945. I was liberated by the Polish army under the Russians. Some of them were friendly to us, others not too. And before we knew that the Russians actually came there. And that's when a whole different issue started. We were helpless people. No food, no money. Where do we go? In the middle of the winter? Or they gave us some clothes too. Yeah, which was nice. But when it got more peaceful, I must say then the Polish people took us into their home and gave us something to eat. And they were a little kinder than usual, <laughs> you know. But we accepted anything that was coming that was good. That's what we wanted. We found one person on a wagon and my mother begged him and begged him to take just her and me to lodge. And he took us. We were told that if we stay under the Russian occupation, or it will be given away back to Poland, we will never be able to cross to the American zone. So we were actually afraid to go. But we had no choice. We faced death many times. So we took a chance. And this group of the Polish soldiers actually trans they took us over the border into the American zone. And this was a displaced person's camp. That was much, much different. We were liberated. So we stayed in the apartment. And then in the middle of January, end of January. My father, who survived, he came back. And so when the Russians liberated his uh, forced labor camp, he came with the Russian army as a translator. And he found us and um, took us back home. We were liberated in the end of January, 1945. And we arrived in Eger, and then we found that all our family was gone. And then, at the end of April, my father pricked his left thumb with a rusty nail. He developed sepsis. And on May 24, 1945, after surviving everything, he died because there was no medication. There was no antibiotics. There was nothing they could give him, so he died. My mother found out a Polish man. Mm -hmm. He was, came with his daughter from the partisan to from Slutsk, and she married him. And then we were, because he was Polish, he wanted to leave. He wanted to leave Russia, and he wanted to try to get to the United States of America because uh, he had sisters there. So, so we end up in the in the camp, uh, display, yeah, 
in the display camp, yeah. I am multilingual, so I found a job as an interpreter for the Russians. I worked with them for a whole year. I left and went to Berlin to the, my first DP, which is a displaced persons camp. Slowly, I started to work my way towards the United States. And I got here in 1948. Of course, I didn't know any English and slowly worked my way up and uh, married a nice lady of a nice family. I have two daughters. I have two grandchildren. And I think life here has been good to me. My mother remarried. One Friday, my stepfather went to temple and she, he met this young man that he knew because they were both in the same business, brought him home for Shabbat dinner. And so we decided to keep company. I didn't introduce him to any of my girlfriends. I didn't want to take a chance. He was a very precious commodity. <laughs> a Jewish boy? We got married in 1955. In 1956, I had a son. We left Hungary in December 19, 1956. There was a revolution in Hungary against the Russians. We put my one-month-old son in a basket, and we walked through fields, 35 kilometers, into Austria. And then we were able to come to America. I said to my mom, you know, Ma, I am going to Israel. I came to Israel. I was staying in a, in a, a home of religious girls. Uh, from, um, from Israel, I got married when I was 19. We went to Belgium. We struggled there a lot because we were not citizens. Every day police came, tell us we have to get out. In the meantime, we made a quota to go to Canada or to America because my mother was there. We decided to go to Canada first. Problems there too. My mother was already in, in the United States. We decided to go to the United States. When I was in Canada, I adopted a little girl, wonderful girl. I have two grandchildren, two great-grandchildren. I met my husband in the displaced persons camp. He was not in the same building where we were, but he was in the town. I even have pictures where he, there was a dental studio there. And he, uh, he didn't pull teeth and cure teeth yet. He was not fully a dentist yet. But that's where I met him. And I guess he fell in love with me, too. <laughs> so we corresponded, and we met again here. And finally, the Polish quarter in 1949 took us. But even then, they tested you medically. You couldn't have anything wrong with your lungs, or if you had any disease, you were rejected. But fortunately, the three of us were admitted, and I'll never forget that on the big ship when we arrived to the United States, and I saw the Statue of Liberty. It was such a beautiful moment. I really admire a lot of survivors being able to go out there and tell their stories and put on a brave face and be able to share that experience to continue telling the story. With some of the survivors I've met, I've seen them cry, they start shaking, and I can't even imagine how hard it must be to have to relive all of that. But it's a good thing that they're doing that so we can continue to tell the story. I've seen Holocaust survivors doing speeches at museums and such, but I've never been one-on-one -on -one being able to talk to them and have a conversation with them. So this experience was really, really special. We should interview and film survivors because you could read pages on a book you could read words, but you could never really see the true emotion in their eyes or how they really felt. 
It was a wonderful experience and I it was very like moving being able to hear everyone's story and I think it's very important that our generation needs to share those stories so that it's not forgotten and it's not going unnoticed. I think it's so important to talk about the Holocaust because if we stop talking about it, then people will forget about it or there are people out there that just believe it didn't happen because they weren't alive during it. And the Holocaust is just so important to keep talking about because it needs to be shared. It needs to be remembered because if we just forget about it, it'll happen again. If we all remember how horrific of an event it was, it, we can stop it from happening if we see it. This, what I and others went through, must never, never be forgotten. Just remember one thing, history is capable of repetition. It can happen. Be very, very alert about everything that's going on. Don't accept bullying. If somebody pulls you out and still things like that, you just look at them, smile, smile, and walk away. Identify the evil powers and don't just be quiet about it. You are the future to everybody, not only to Jewish people. Evil powers, I don't have to tell you what's going on. This planet Earth was for all of us. We have to be kind to each other. The message is very clear. First of all, be tolerant of one another and stamp out hatred because it's the cause of all the problems that we're going through and went through. You have to realize that you are entrusted with a very important task. You have to make sure that your children, your grandchildren, your friends, anybody you come in contact with, know that the Holocaust happened. That six million Jews and five more million others were systematically killed. And if somebody says it never happened, you have to have the answer. And the other thing you have to make sure that you won't let hate guide your steps because all that happened was because of hate. You have to make sure it will not happen.